August 2020 produced one of the most intense heat waves we've seen in the UK. We had six consecutive days where somewhere recorded 34 degrees or higher. That's the first time since reliable records began. And as is often the case in the UK, when we get these heat waves and the hot and humid weather in the summer, they quite often end with a bit of a thundery breakdown. And for East Anglia, that came on Sunday the 16th of August 2020. In this video, we're going to be looking at an extreme rainfall event. These thunderstorms on this particular day currently now rank as the wettest August day on record because the volume of rain that was produced by these thunderstorms in just a few hours during the afternoon on that particular Sunday. So to start off, let's have a look at the surface pattern that's going on. This is produced by the Met Office for midday GMT or one o'clock local time on that Sunday, the 16th of August. We can see it's a fairly slack pattern. We've got a small surface low near the Brest Peninsula. Uh, this occlusion with a line of thunderstorms crossing the channel, that comes into play by the end of the day. We'll come back to that in the video a little bit later on. And this shortwave trough here, helping to generate some thunderstorms at lunchtime and then on through the afternoon as well. But quite often thunderstorms rely on what's going on higher up in the atmosphere. And so as forecasters, we would look at the 500 millibar pattern, for example. So this is about three to three and a half miles above the ground. And we can see this upper trough here and uh, this upper low near the Bay of Biscay lifting north with time. This would be associated with a cold pool, so some cold air higher up in the atmosphere. Remember, we've got that very warm, humid air down at ground level. So when you've got warm air at the surface, cold air higher up, that creates a lot of instability. But also with this upper low, what you tend to find is on the leading edge, we get uh, pulses of divergence, if you like, areas of divergence running up. And that basically encourages lift through the atmosphere. So when you've got an unstable environment, and lifting mechanism going on, then you know there is a risk of some showers and thunderstorms breaking out. Another thing that forecasters tend to look at are these diagrams. For those unfamiliar, these are called tephigrams. They are essentially a plot of temperature along the x-axis here, so getting warmer to the right of the diagram, uh, with height, and the height here is measured uh, in millibars. Now the surface, this brown shaded area, this is our ground level if you like, I've modified this diagram to include a level at the surface representative of what the conditions were like at Tibbenham Airfield in South Norfolk uh, at one o'clock local time on this particular day of interest. Uh, the red line here, that's our air temperature, so you can see the air temperature typically gets colder as it leans to the left of the, of the diagram as you go up with height until you get to the tropopause and then it starts to get warmer again uh, entering into the stratosphere. The green line here, that's our dew point. So essentially where these two lines are very close together, that's where the air is very moist. And when the lines are much further apart, the air is drier. So we've got a couple of dry levels, uh, dry layers in here. But the main thing to point out on this diagram, I guess, is between 500 millibars and the surface, the mean relative humidity is 80%. That's quite moist and that will come into play uh, later on in this video as well. Now on here I've also put on the parcel trajectory. So to create a thunderstorm we need to lift an air parcel from some level. It can be from the ground. It could be from a level above the ground which is called elevated thunderstorms. Uh, but either way this is the sort of typical path it would take and as long as that path is to the right of our red line it means the air parcel is warmer than the surrounding environment and so it's unstable. Warm air wants to rise and so it will continue to do so until it gets into air that is actually colder uh, than the surrounding environment. The orange shading here, that's our CAPE, Convective Available Potential Energy. It's a measure of how much energy is available in the atmosphere to generate these big showers and thunderstorms. So this particular tephigram gives us a reading of 1,600 joules per kilogram of CAPE. And past studies have shown that this typically only happens once a year in the UK. Obviously some years might have a few days, other years might have none, but on average it's about once. Uh, a year. And this diagram would also suggest, and also confirmed with satellite data, that the cloud tops, roughly in this area here, uh, would be around 39,000 feet and measured as minus 62 degrees for the top of these thunderstorms uh, in the afternoon by satellite data. So we know what's going on higher up in the atmosphere. We know that looking at some of these sounding data, uh, the profiles are quite unstable. What we need to find out is exactly where we think these thunderstorms are going to develop. So that's why we start looking at computer modeling. So here we have four different computer models all run in the morning of this particular day. So these were run before the event took place. The red dash line here is the main area where we saw the extreme rainfall. And what's clear very quickly is none of these models simulated thunderstorms in this particular area where we saw the most extreme rainfall. Now up here we've got the Dutch Met Service uh, high resolution model, we've got the UK Met Office one here, 
and a wharf model using the GFS for boundary conditions. And generally speaking, when you look at them or squint at them, you can clearly see that there is a strong signal for the western side of this panel. So Cambridgeshire, West Norfolk, West Suffolk, thunderstorms likely to break out here, but none of them really quite capture how far east these storms did develop on this particular day. So if the models haven't quite captured it, we know something must be going on. We don't quite know what it is yet. So the best way really is to look at observations for that day. Now we have a handful of weather stations across East Anglia. These are marked by the black triangles and squares that you see on this map here. Uh, these are run primarily by the UK Met Office. This one here, Reds at Weybourne, for example. Uh, but they're not particularly dense in coverage and they can quite easily miss these little features that could develop thunderstorms, mesoscale features. So what we've done for this particular study is we've looked at about 315 of these home weather stations that people have in their back gardens. They upload the data freely to Weather Underground and we've added them onto this map here in this small domain centred over our area of interest and we're using this high resolution data then to try and simulate what was going on at ground level during this day to see what might have caused the thunderstorms uh, that did eventually happen. So let's start going through the event then. Well, in the morning, first thing in the morning, this is half past eight, as you can see here in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, so we've got this cluster of thunderstorms, that occlusion coming out of France, moving across the channel and, as is often the case, weakening. Uh, we've got these elevated thunderstorms. Remember, these are driven by things going on higher up in the atmosphere, not at ground level uh, across North Norfolk, but a lot of quiet weather at this time of the day. On the satellite picture, we can see this thick cloud here, thick high cloud showing up from those thunderstorms coming across the channel and these elevated thunderstorms popping off in North Norfolk. But again, at this stage of the day, a lot of quiet weather across East Anglia. Now it was very humid. Temperatures were typically in the high teens. Dew point temperatures were also in the high teens. Very moist conditions, a lot of low stratus cloud covering the area through the morning. Now this line here, this little thin uh, bit of cirrus coming up from the south, that's usually indicative of something higher up in the atmosphere that's promoting lift, some of that divergence coming in. And you can see as this bluer coloured cloud starts approaching from the south, elevated convection starts firing quite widely across Suffolk and Norfolk, our particular area of interest in this yellow area. That's where we start to see the first thunderstorm of the day uh, breaking out, which was quite likely elevated in nature, i.e. it wasn't because of what was going on at ground level, but because of things going on slightly higher up in the atmosphere. You can see at that time we have a sudden uptick in shower activity across much of Norfolk, and then they die within an hour. But our thunderstorm of interest carries on gaining strength as it becomes surface-based, running off to the northwest, and that's where things start to get uh, a little bit more interesting. This is what the first thunderstorm of the day eventually, when it became uh, much more organised, looked like from Steve, who was storm chasing the area, and many people on the day talking about how it was dry one minute, and then you had this wall of water where the visibility significantly reduced when you drive into these things. So here's our meso analysis of what was going on on that particular day. So this is using all of those weather stations in the region. This is a plot of temperature. Uh, and pressure, mean sea level pressure, at 0.1 millibar intervals. There's a hint of a small surface low somewhere in the dis area, uh, but clearly the warming is strongest across East Suffolk. That's where we saw the cloud breaks uh, first off in the morning. Uh, and then by midday local time, it's warming up quite nicely to the southeast, 23 degrees in Suffolk. Notice we've got this sort of dent in our temperature in this general area, and that's because that is where our thunderstorm is, the rain cooled air coming out of this thunderstorm, cooling the air down. Uh, at ground level. By one o'clock, our thunderstorms are pushing off to the northwest, affecting Thetford. They're still, though, developing new cells southwest of Dis. And again, that's where we have this lower temperature reading at, at this particular time of day. Warming up still, 24 degrees in Ipswich, much cooler here. And earlier in the day, the winds were broadly northeasterly across the whole map. Now we're starting to see the winds pushing in different directions uh, because the outflow from these storms spreading out in different directions and where you get the outflow pushing out of these thunderstorms, meeting that synoptic northeasterly surface wind, that's where you start to get an area of convergence where the winds are meeting. That is what this pink shading here is showing, moisture convergence. Where these two meet, the air gets forced upwards and that creates new thunderstorm cells from the surface. So by two o'clock in the afternoon, our first cluster of storms all the way out here pushing into Cambridgeshire, but still new cells developing near Dis and this process continues through the afternoon. So again, you can quite clearly see this cold pool because of those thunderstorms, hotting up 25 degrees down in southeast Suffolk. And again, there's our moisture conver convergence still showing up near 
uh, the Dis area. By three o'clock in the afternoon, there's our first cluster of storms well out over Peterborough, but we've still got this line going up from Dis towards Watton, towards Swatham. And again, very hot conditions to the southeast and this hot air extending up towards Norwich. Much cooler air here because that's where our thunderstorms, of course, are. And remember, because the hot air is over here and the winds are northeasterly, all of this is being drawn in to the area of where these thunderstorms are developing. So plenty of warm, moist air being continuously fed into the system here. There's our convergence at three o'clock in the afternoon. And then by four o'clock, still that line of thunderstorms. Now we're starting to see these other storms developing pretty much where the model suggested they would across West Suffolk and Cambridgeshire. So big clusters of storms here, but our particular line is still going. Uh, we're now many hours into this event and we're still building these storms. Five o'clock, still those storms developing in the same area, running off to the northwest. Still that cluster of storms over Cambridgeshire. And here comes our, our occlusion, our big band of rain coming up from the south, which will ultimately suppress the air temperature and kill off these thunderstorms. But there's our convergence really marked now by late afternoon to the east of these storms. We're also starting to see other areas of convergence showing where the other thunderstorms are, are taking place at this particular moment in time. And notice how the air has cooled significantly where we've got that big mass of storms over Cambridgeshire. The winds have turned northerly as well, whereas we've still got an easterly flow of some sort into our little uh, low pressure area uh, near Dis. Now by six o'clock, big mass of rain coming up, but still these storms are firing in the same area, running off to the northwest. And then by seven o'clock, it's a mess. A lot of rain spreading up. Still though, we are trying to develop these little cells in that same area before eventually the whole thing clears off to the north. Much cooler in western areas, still quite muggy and warm in the east, but even here temperatures have come down quite a bit from the 25 degrees we saw earlier uh, in the day. So here's a radar loop of what happened. Remember, this is where we think storms kept firing. So the first storm develops, clears off to the northwest, but notice how new cells keep developing in this area and continuously run northwestwards over the same areas until eventually this big mass of rain comes in and a lot of it then tends to weaken. So in a schematic form, this is how things looked before the event, broadly a northeasterly wind across much of Norfolk. So here's Norwich up here, Dis um, down here. So northeasterly winds. Our first thunderstorm gets going, creates this big cold pool where the air is spreading out in all directions. Now on the western side, the winds are blowing out of the storm in the same direction that the background wind is blowing in. So you'll get minimal convergence here. But on the eastern side, notice the winds are blowing against this northeasterly wind. And so that's going to create our area of convergence, which is this yellow shading here. Now, remember, we've got this corridor, very warm air to the east. That's constantly being blown into this area. So untouched, very warm, very unstable air being pushed into our area of convergence, creating these thunderstorms. And then they run northwestwards over Great Hockham, over Watton. Uh, and so this process continues all afternoon with new cells developing and running over the same areas previously affected. Here's a cross section then from the Met Office radar network uh, from the Ingham site in Lincolnshire. So we're cutting across northwest to southeast through this line of thunderstorms. So the storms are developing in roughly this area and then they run northwestwards across the line. And you can see the brightest echoes with the youngest uh, storm cells here. This one at this particular time, right over the A11 dual carriageway with some very intense downpours. And each individual cell then weakens as they run away off to the northwest, away from our, our main area where these storms uh, are developing. So how much rain fell? That's the key point of this whole study, really. And for this, we've used a combination of radar estimates, but also over 100 readings from farmers who kindly supplied their rainfall measurements from the air. It's a very rural part of Norfolk. There's a lot of farmers, and luckily they have a lot of rain gauges in this part of the world. So the rain gauges provided by farmers are the black triangles you see on the map here and the red boxes are the official rain gauges. Clearly the bullseye here just south of Great Hockham over 200 millimetres on this particular map. But you can quite clearly see the storms start here and then run northwest across this map. Now the area of the most intense rain is actually quite narrow and it's certainly plausible that this could have shifted over Thetford for example. If that had happened it would have been a much much bigger story I suspect. Uh, but because it was over a relatively rural part of Norfolk impacts were somewhat limited as we'll see a little bit later on. Zooming into this box then in the uh, most intense rainfall, the highest one of the whole day was from this Environment Agency rain gauge, 240 millimetres of rain in a 24 hour period, but most of this fell in six to eight hours. Uh, nearby we had 211. Now this is from a tipping bucket rain gauge. This one is a manual rain gauge. Assuming they're both correct, the distance between these two 
500 meters would give you a rainfall gradient of 62 millimeters per kilometer. In other words, you could be in one place and it'd be completely dry, but a kilometer away, the other side of a large field, for example, and you've had two inches of rain. So this really highlights how intense downpours can be significant over very short distances when it comes to these showers and thunderstorms in the summer season. Now, how does this rank with previous severe events in the UK? Well, for one hour, we had 84 millimeters measured by one of the farmers in the area. Uh, so, you know, you can see some of these other records. It's, it's in the same area, but it's not the most intense we've seen for a one hour duration event. In fact, some places have had more in less time. But when you get that same intensity over many hours, it really becomes quite clear by four hours, for example, 191 millimeters for this event. It sits in there as in the top three of the most intense short duration rainfall events recorded in the UK. Of course, this, this is dependent on rainfall gauges being in the right place to capture uh, the extreme events. But quite clearly, this is quite a remarkable event for rainfall. And so because of this, it now sits as the wettest August day on record. Now these use 24 hour rainfall periods, but clearly this event, most of it fell in just six to eight hours. So a pretty remarkable event. As I say, impacts were limited though. We did see some flooding of homes and businesses in the area, and uh, some of the roads were also blocked because of flooding for a time as well. Uh, Norfolk Fire and Rescue Service say they had 30 calls, mostly flooding related from Watton and the surrounding villages. Remarkably, no lightning related impacts, despite there being 600 cloud to ground lightning strikes in this area, there were no impacts at all from that. It was during the peak harvest season and many farmers talked about their rush to keep the grain stores dry because it had been one of the worst wheat harvests for decades. A very wet February followed by a very dry May really took its effect on the wheat harvest in this particular year. But there were no reports of any hail, uh, talking to Toro. And the maximum gusts that we've seen from these storms on this day, both from the home weather station network but also the Met Office network, only around 30 miles an hour. So yeah, there were some gusty winds but nothing too strong that would cause uh, any major damage or anything like that. So just to summarize those key points, the first storm of the day was quite likely elevated, i.e. not dependent on surface conditions. So in theory, it could have developed anywhere. And we did see others developing in Norfolk as well, but they eventually did die. Uh, but it produced cold outflow, and that's what enhanced this low level convergence to the east of that first thunderstorm complex. And so that set this chain of events through the afternoon with new cells developing in the same area running northwestwards only for another one to develop and then run over the same area again. By the evening the thunderstorms start to weaken because we had that big mass of rain coming up from the south, temperatures started to drop and so we start to lose that instability that we built through the day. Now it's quite likely because a lot of about half of the rain that falls out of a thunderstorm actually evaporates in the air around a thunderstorm uh, but on this particular day, because of that very high relative humidity in the uh, bottom half of the atmosphere, for example, the fact that the storms were quite slow moving and the fact they were back building over the same areas all contributed to these very extreme rainfall totals that we saw, 240 millimetres in six to eight hours. And it's quite possible the whole event could have been completely different had that first thunderstorm elevated, not developed in that place. Either this event could have been avoided entirely, or perhaps uh, it could have affected a different area such as Thetford. And that's probably why the models were struggling with this. They're good at surface-based convection, which is uh, dependent on surface conditions, key features, topography, for example, but also temperature, uh, and wind speed and convergence, that sort of thing. But they're not quite so good at elevated convection. And if they haven't quite captured the first cell of the day, that's possibly why they didn't do quite so well. Something to bear in mind if you're looking at your weather app, because obviously some models will tell you it'll be a dry day. And interestingly, if any, if any of you were looking at an app using those models for this particular day, and you were in that red area that saw the 240 millimeters of rain, your app probably told you it would be a dry day, when in reality, you've just set a new record for the August rainfall um, in the UK. So just reiterating, apps are pretty limited uh, in their guidance, if you like, during these particular extreme summer thunderstorm setups as well. So that's a sort of brief overview, if you like, of this particular event. I'll leave you with another photo from Steve, who was storm chasing on the day with this rather interesting lowering uh, from this thunderstorm complex near Dis. Thank you for watching.